And welcome back to the Wellness Paradox Podcast. I'm so grateful that you can join us on this journey towards greater human flourishing. As always, I'm your host, Michael Stack, an exercise physiologist by training and a health entrepreneur and a health educator by trade. And I'm fascinated by a phenomena I call the wellness paradox. This paradox, as I view it, is the trust, interaction, and communication gap between fitness and wellness professionals and medical professionals. This podcast is all about closing off that gap by disseminating the latest, most evidence-based, and most engaging information in the health sciences. And to do that, in episode 43, we're joined by Monica Regnagel. Monica has a master's degree in human nutrition, and this discussion is going to be an interesting deep dive into weight loss and all the factors that are associated with it. Uh, Monica has a very interesting background in that in addition to her master's degree, she also has a strong background in culinary arts, and she's a fellow podcaster who has the opportunity to talk to a number of people in the fitness, medical, and nutrition ecosystem. And she has some specific interventional work that she does with individuals who are looking to lose weight. And I know this has been a topic that we've discussed in various ways, shapes, or forms on our podcast. We've talked about weight stigma. We've talked about a number of issues related to weight loss and weight management. And I think this conversation with Monica is a great deep dive into several specific areas that will be very actionable for the fitness professionals that are listening to the podcast. Any additional information we'd like to share from this episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode four, three. Please enjoy this conversation with Monica Regnagel. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Monica Regnagel. Monica, thank you so much for joining us on The Wellness Paradox. It's so nice to be here. Very excited to be joined by another fellow podcaster. Whenever I have the opportunity to interview another podcaster, I'm always very excited because at the very least, I can guarantee that they have a solid microphone. <laughs> That's right. This is going to be a, a fun discussion for us today because as, as Monica and I were talking before we came on air, uh, there's a lot that we want to cover here and, and we're going to do our best to get to everything and try to intersect everything for our audience. But Monica, just for starters, why don't you give us an idea of your background and a little bit more of what you do? So my training is in nutrition. And so I come through the food angle, what we put into our bodies. Um, and I've been, um, I've been hosting a nutrition focused podcast called the nutrition diva for 14 years now. So a long time. Um, but as I've worked with more people and I do, um, group coaching programs, online coaching programs around weight loss, around healthier eating habits, that kind of thing. And over the years, as I've worked with more and more people, I came to realize that so much of what people needed in order to make changes in their life was not really more information about nutrition. <laughs> it wasn't about really when it came down to it, that information is relatively easy to come by. You know, what people really needed was tools to help them, uh, live by their good intentions mm -hmm. to, to put their good intentions into action, to, to be, um, consistent with their habits and not just kind of go on a wild tear every January and, you know, uh, try to clean it all up and then have it all kind of fall apart by February. And that's where it stays for the rest of the year. So my focus has shifted or maybe just expanded to include a lot of work around behavior change mm -hmm. and how we make decisions as humans, how we negotiate that. So uh, two years ago, I launched a second podcast with co-host Brock Armstrong. He is like you, a fitness professional. And that podcast is called the change Academy. Mm -hmm. And that's where we really get to talk more about uh, this really fascinating art and science of behavior change um, and how that intersects with my field of nutrition and his field of fitness. So that's, I guess, in a nutshell, what I've been doing until I got here today. Yeah, absolutely. Before we dive into all that, just super quick, 14 years ago, a, a podcast. I don't even know if 14 years ago, podcasts were a thing. What caused you to want to start a podcast 14 years ago? I'm just intensely curious on that. 
I was very unclear on what a podcast was when I became a <laughs> podcaster. And to be honest with you, I thought it was going to be just sort of a brief little fling, you uh -huh. know, like, oh, we'll do podcasts for a while and then we'll move on to the next thing. I never dreamed that podcasts would become as widespread and as mainstream as they had. So I was kind of lucky to be in the right place at the right time. But before that, um, I had been blogging for um, a well-known nutrition site run by Condé Nast called nutritiondata.com and had built up sort of an online platform just through the written word mm -hmm. writing. Um, and I was being interviewed on other people's podcasts, mm. you know, I was like, Oh, what's a podcast, you know? And, and I was at that point, one of those guests who did not show up with a solid mic, you know, I was <laughs> like, can I, can we do it on my phone? Fair enough. So, um, on my landline. Yeah. Right. So, I was being interviewed every once in a while on a podcast. And then I had all I could do to actually like figure out how to find and listen to that podcast once it published, because it was just such an unfamiliar platform. And, yeah. um, and one day I was just chatting with the producer after we finished taping. And he said, have you ever thought about doing a podcast and uh, introduced me to a network um, that's run through Macmillan audio called quick and dirty tips that uh -huh. have a, a a suite of podcasts from professionals in all different areas in finance and psychology and parenting and education and language. The flagship podcast was Grammar Girl. I don't know if mm. you've ever run across it. She's one of the OG podcasters. Uh -huh. They were building this network. They did not have a nutrition podcast. I couldn't yeah. believe it. It's like, how, how is this even possible that you don't have one? So I cold called them. And a few months later, I started the Nutrition Diva podcast with them. And I've been with them ever since. And that's been um, just, they've just been amazing partners in helping me find my voice, my audience, and all of the technical details that go into producing and promoting a podcast. So it was really just such a stroke of good fortune. And some of my listeners, your listeners won't know this. My listeners will know that before I went to school for nutrition, that was kind of a second act for me. My wow. first act back way back. Um, I went to music school and I studied to be an opera singer ah. and I was an opera singer for about 10 years before mm -hmm. I retrained in nutrition. So to go back into a medium, that's about the voice was like coming home, you know, very, very fascinating, fascinating. <laughs> you and I will connect on a lot of levels, but not on the level of singing. If we want everyone to tune this podcast out, it would be me starting to sing. So <laughs> okay. I, I love the, the new podcast that you host because really as, as a nutrition professional, a dietitian, an exercise professional, an exercise physiologist, we are two sides of the same coin, so to speak. And mm -hmm. we connected over LinkedIn. We actually had to remember exactly what we connected over, but it was around a, a weight neutral approach to treating diabetes. And so I want to kind of abstract away from that, not specifically to talk about diabetes, but you're starting to hear the weight neutral approach mm -hmm. proliferate a little more, certainly in the dietetics community, it's now starting to get into the fitness community a little bit. And this is a fascinating area. And I feel like there's a lot of polarizing views on it. Certainly if you Google it, you'll get a lot of polarizing views to yeah. tee this up. Why don't you start with just defining what a weight neutral approach is it, it, to the extent that you can, and then uh, maybe we can get into some of the, the pros and cons and how it's actually being operationalized from what you've seen. Yeah. Well, um, I get, you know, the cynic in me wants to say it's kind of born of a, well, if it, defeat, you know, like, yeah. well, if we can't beat them, we'll join them. And the, what I mean by that is, you know, we've been fighting this, what we call the epidemic, the epidemic of obesity for 20 years now, 30 years now, and making very little headway. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, okay, if we cannot figure out how to motivate people or support people or teach people how to change their body weight, then let's not waste any more time and energy on that. And let's see what else we can do to meet them where they are and to improve their other metrics of health, you know, whether that's their eating habits, you know, just the composition of their diet or their movement practices, their exercise, you know, can we be, if we are going to be a fat society, can we at least be a fit society? Those kinds of conversations. I understand where it comes from. And I think that there's some there's some uh, value to that. Like, okay, let's not just keep throwing ourselves at this brick wall for another 30 years. It's not a, what can we do if we can't do that? What can we do? I think there's also an aspect of this that has to do with 
equity and inclusion and recognizing the profound bias against overweight and obese people that, um, that is practiced in society, in um, commerce, in the workplace and in the medical profession. And so I think there's also an element of this that is trying to push back against any kind of moral judgment uh, or, or anything else that should be attributed or different st set of um, standards of care or treatment um, toward people who are overweight, suffer from obesity. And I think that that's valid too. You know, we can clearly see the bias in medical care mm -hmm. for people who are overweight. So there's there's some of that. Um, and I think these are super good conversations to be having. I just don't want to completely give up on the idea that yes, a body has infinite value and worthy worth and dignity, no matter what it's BMI, no matter what it's size, uh, you know, unquestionable and weight is not the only thing that matters to our health. There are a lot of ways that we can approach making somebody's life healthier and body healthier than merely by reducing the pull of gravity on their, on their body. Um, but I don't want to start pretending, and this is where I feel like it gets, goes a little too far. I don't want to start pretending that weight doesn't matter mm -hmm. because it does. And so when we get studies or analyses that seem to suggest that, Hey, you know what, if you can just keep your blood sugar online, or if you can be fit enough, or if your cholesterol is within a certain range, doesn't matter what your weight is. And I think that takes it a step too far, but what do you, where do you come in to this conversation? Oh, the podcaster asked the other podcaster a question. Very nice. Uh, well, first off, before I, I answer, I, I think that that is a very accurate assessment of where seen, things seem to be at. We've tried, and at least on a population health level, largely failed to improve the BMI status of our country. And you just have to look at the charts from the CDC to tell you that. But it does seem to be a very defeatist perspective to just say, okay, well, if we can't beat them, I guess we're just going to have to join them. And mm -hmm. I completely agree on the weight stigma concept. I, I'm, I'll remind our listeners to go back to Kendra Sonneville's podcast that we did. She's a researcher at the University of Michigan that actually studies weight stigma. And it, mm -hmm. it, it is a very real thing. And you don't even have to be in the medical profession to know that you know, we place moral judgments on people because of the amount of weight that they carry. But I, I view it as very, I think, similar to you, very reductionistic to think it's binary. Like it's like mm -hmm. it, you either have to be weight neutral or you have to be pro weight loss and you're either one camp or the other. I think mm -hmm. like most things in life, the truth lies in the middle. I think the challenge that we've ran into as let's just say an allied health field is that as one group goes more this way, yes. the other group just has to pull more that way. I don't just think that's in allied health. I think that's in, in, sadly Clearly. in every aspect of our society. And I think <laughs> right. that's probably you know, what has happened here. So mm -hmm. in answering that, to turn it back to you, from your perspective, talk about the, the health benefits of actually weighing less, because partly the, you know, the health at, at any size people, uh, health at every size people, right? Every size, is that the- H-A-E-S, right? Yeah, health yeah, at every size. Every size. I, I know that the terminology specific there. They'll say that like on some level, it doesn't matter at all, but we know, you know chronic inflammatory issues and things like that are real things. So what is the true benefit to even losing you know, five to 10% of your body weight in terms of its overall improvement in your health? I'm glad you picked that number as your example, because it turns out that losing 5% of your total yeah. body weight, even if you remain in the category of obese or overweight can have profound benefits on your health risk metrics, things like um, blood sugar utilization, fasting blood glucose, insulin sensitivity. You can really improve your insulin sensitivity with that relatively incremental change mm -hmm. in body weight. Um, so it's worth it. You know, you can take a lot of uh, load off your, your joints, your knees and decrease knee pain. You can decrease sleep apnea. You can decrease your blood pressure in a way. It almost seems to me um, that the body responds to the direction that mm -hmm. you're moving at just as much to your position. If, if you know what I mean, you know, yeah. like it's not just whether you're taking a certain box in terms of your BMA, but what is the trend, you know, yeah. is your body moving toward, you know, a healthier weight toward a greater level of fitness that's 
I feel like what your body is responding to at least as much as, you know, like where, where are you right now? You know? Yeah, absolutely. And we, I you use the ten, five to 10% number for the same reason that you intentionally would sure. is, is that that is the, the generally recommended range. You look at the CDC's diabetes prevention program, and that mm-hmm. was the, the goal that they set for that program. And I'm keen to ask you on the, the dissonance that exists between that clinical number of five to 10%, which we know through a lot of research, that is a very important number. And what you see kind of in the mainstream media, because you mm-hmm. and I both know when we sit down with a client or a patient, we talk about that number and then they do the quick math in their head. And then my 200 pound, 45 year old woman says, well, I want to lose way more than, than 20 pounds or 10 pounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how does the, the media and the, I guess the marketing machine that is the weight loss industry play into this in a way that negatively affects evidence informed professionals like us? Exactly the way you just described, you know, that when we try to say the benefits of that, of that first, and I'll just say, it it doesn't have to be the last 5% of your body weight, you leave, but the first one, you know, that you get to really celebrate a concrete accomplishment and victory after that first 5%, you don't have to stop there. right? Right. But, um, but exactly the way you just said, if you spell that out as sort of to give people an interim goal to, to work towards that feels more attainable, that feels Mm -hmm. more reachable they will immediately do the math and say Mm -hmm. like, yeah, but then I'll still have 50 more pounds to lose before. And part of this is our relentless hammering on the BMI. And that number has to be below 25. If you're going to be considered normal or, or, or healthy or something like we've internalized that number. And so we see that as the, the destined, the goal Mm -hmm. and the destination. And we really um, are not encouraged to, understand the real benefits of all of the, all of the movement in between where we are now and where we might be headed. And I really have worked with a lot of people who, uh, who start out um, in the obese category and move way well down into like a BMI of 25, some 26. So they're still technically uh, overweight. Their health is so much improved. They've created habits that they can sustain. They actually like their bodies and the lifestyle that's required to keep them there. And at that point, am I going to flog them to lose another seven pounds to, to tick that box? Absolutely not. I actually feel like if you have decreased your health risks by achieving a healthy enough body weight, and you're able to, you're happy with the way your body looks, feels, and functions you can do the things that you want to do. You feel good in your, in your skin and you're content with, and this is I'm preaching from our, our weight loss program. You're content with the habits and the lifestyle that's required to keep you there. And that's when we forget to take into account, right? Absolutely. You're there. You won, you won the prize. You know, in our approach to sustainable weight loss, we actually look at the, your ideal weight as having three essential components. One is you're not at increased health risks because of your weight. Mm-hmm. And as we've just talked about, if you've substantially decreased your weight, even if you're not technically in, you know, the 18 to 25 BMI, you've probably accomplished that. Yep. Number two, you're happy with the way that your body looks, feels, and functions. You can do the things you want to do in your life you know, and number three, and here's the one I think people forget to take into account. You're satisfied. You're content with the habits and the lifestyle that's required to keep you there. Because if you've, you know, white knuckled it to your goal weight, but you're miserable, you can't socialize with your friends. You can't participate in, you know, your favorite activities without breaking your diet. Then I'm not sure we've served you very well. Yeah, I think you nailed that. There are so many people that think once they achieve that number that everything in life will be great. (laughs) And and if you cannot lead a lifestyle that you would enjoy, I've often said there's a difference between the weight that you can achieve and the one that you should achieve. The weight that you can achieve is way lower than the one that you should achieve because your life's not going to be very, I think, comfortable then beyond that. And this is not for this podcast because it is a rabbit hole, but looking at the construct of BMI in and of Mm. itself and where it came from and what its actual validity is, that that's a whole nother very tribalistic conversation. But I want to keep going down this path of, okay, completely giving up on weight loss doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And we can acknowledge that some degree, five to 10% of weight loss, and maybe more if somebody can feel comfortable with the lifestyle they're leading is a productive path to go down. 
Let's talk about in, from your perspective, from all the years you've been doing what you're doing, how to effectuate this best. And since there's exercise professionals that are listening to this podcast, you know, I'd like you to kind of draw from your other podcast to see if we can intersect the two of, you know, where does nutrition stop and start here? Where does exercise stop and start? And probably why do they need to exist together? Yeah. I, I want to pick my words carefully here because I don't want to make any enemies, but I, and I'll also just say, I really enjoy physical activity, exercise. I enjoy the benefits of it. I actually enjoy doing it, you know, because mm -hmm. uh, I kept looking until I found the things that I liked to do. Mm -hmm. So this is not spoken from the, the point of view of somebody who does not enjoy exercise, but it bothers me how we have come to see exercise and prioritize exercise primarily as a way of burning calories mm -hmm. to pursue weight loss or in the worst possible for formulation to earn food you know, mm. and we have apps that will calculate how much more we get to eat after we have run so many miles or something like this. And I just think this is so misguided and so harmful. First of all, just to view exercise as either a punishment for something that you ate or some sort of bargain that you have to fulfill in order to buy food. I just think that that's such an unhealthy, it ignores all the great benefits of exercise for your mood and your, um, and your body and your life and all mm -hmm. of that. I feel like it, it doesn't do service to exercise, to reduce it to a calorie burning pursuit. And it turns out that from my perspective, and I'd be happy to hear yours, if it's different, that burning calories through exercise is a very inefficient and ineffective way to pursue weight loss. Yeah, a thousand percent. This is with a physiology nerd inside of me just wants to scream out about all the all the adaptive and all the compensatory mechanisms that yes. the human body has when you start to burn calories through exercise. Your body is going to, and I don't want to steal your thunder here, but essentially your body is going to work to compensate to have those calories not be burned somewhere else during your day. Right. Right. And ironically, the kinds of exercises that we've been told to do because they burn the most calories are exactly the kinds of exercise that are most likely to stimulate appetite responses. Mm -hmm. And so then you're working against another countervailing wind, you know, you're exercising to lose weight, but you're making yourself starving, you know, and often that will lead you to over replace whatever calories you burned, but that's not why you should have been exercising in the first place. So uh, a lot of the work that we do in our weight loss program, which I run with an exercise professional. So we're definitely bringing both the nutrition and the exercise to the table, but we spend a lot of time trying to uncouple the, the benefits of exercise and the reasons we want to exercise. Well, first from their calorie burn, because that's just a, that's just a myth. It's a, it's a red herring, you know, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you saw in the news a couple of months ago, uh, Kevin Hall, who did the original notorious biggest loser mm -hmm. study in, was that 2014? The first yeah, one of it that, was, it was quite, it was quite That's some number time that ago. pops up, but, yeah. and he looked at the, the participants on that reality show and it was tragic, right? It was heartbreaking. I mean, these people had lost between a third and half of their body weight. Mm -hmm. And two years later, they had regained almost all the weight, but it wasn't because they just kind of slacked off and, and started overeating. It was because their metabolisms were so profoundly, um, profoundly warped yeah. <laughs> by this extreme weight loss. Well, at the time, Kevin Hall and pretty much all of us kind of attributed this to the metabolic response compensation to the weight loss that when the body experiences a profound reduction in its mass, it compensates by ratcheting down the metabolism to preserve energy, to, to survive. Right. And so we were like, yep, this is what happens when you lose too much weight too quickly. And I do think that fast weight loss is, you know, 80% of the problem. Mm -hmm. And we could talk about that maybe on another episode, yeah. but more recently, um, Hall has gone back and looked at that data again, in light of new research that I'm sure you're familiar with, you probably already discussed it with your podcast listeners on what you just mentioned, that metabolic adaptation to exercise. Mm -hmm. Now, remember back to those biggest loser series, what did they do all day while they weren't eating, while they were eating 800 calories a day, they exercised like six, eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. 
And now in retrospect, you know, in view of more recent evidence, it looks like maybe it was the exercise that was a big part of that metabolic ad- adaptation. I mean, it's really kind of staggering, isn't it? I'd like to take a quick break from today's episode to tell you a little something about one of our sponsors. As all of you are well aware, addressing the wellness paradox is a lifelong passion project for me. And when you're going to go on a long journey, it's difficult to go it alone. You need to find like-minded individuals that are willing to go on that crusade with you. And that's exactly what I found at the MRF Institute. The team over at the MRF Institute creates educational content for fitness and wellness professionals who are serious about becoming a part of our healthcare continuum. Getting on the healthcare continuum is all about leveling up our skills to be looked at as that valued resource provider. The wellness paradox is certainly an avenue for you to do that, but we need many different levers to pull if we're going to get there. And the MRF Institute is definitely one of those levers. You can go to their website, mrfinstitute.org to find all kinds of great, informative, free informational content. And if you choose to engage with any of their paid content, they've created a coupon code specifically for wellness paradox listeners. You can enter in WP2022, that's WP and then the number 2022 to the website at checkout to receive a 15% discount on your purchase. I highly recommend you go check out mrfinstitute.org. Now back to today's episode. Yeah, it is. And, and it, it kind of comports with a lot of the research that you're seeing uh, nowadays. And uh, it's not Stefan Guillenet. His name's escaping me right now. And I don't know why it is. Who's done research on uh, some Aboriginal hunter-gatherer tribes and seen that they don't have a much higher daily energy expenditure than we do here in Western society. And it's just this, uh, there is a, a limitation to the amount of calories the human body can expend. And all of it makes sense because it, it's a, it's a, preservation mechanism ultimately at the end of the day. And, and, and that's the, the point that you made. And, and so I think that's a, a, an important lesson. So, so take that the step further then, what is exercise's role in this process? Kind of what is nutrition's role in this process? Because it's clear that exercise may, may actually not be the path to weight loss the way many people talk about. Yeah. At least not in like a way to burn off enough yeah. calories yes. or to burn off fat. Like we really yeah. just need to let that go. Right. Yeah. But what I see, and now I'm, I'm going to lean on my, um, you know, my professional relationships with other fitness professionals, what I see as the, the main roles of exercise in weight loss and weight maintenance is its effect on body composition, mm-hmm. um, you know, by maintaining lean muscle, which we, if we're not pretty diligent about, um, stressing the muscles, we're going to tend to lose a fair amount of lean muscle tissue when we lose weight, especially if we're losing weight quickly. Uh, and, and so exercise can be very effective in helping us maintain our body composition. And then that sets up a virtuous cycle where we are actually supporting our metabolic rate as we are losing weight. You know, we're having more active tissue in our bodies. Um, it also just, supports a a more active, healthy, functional lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the the things that the, this focus on exercise has um, left on the table is the benefits of the other 23 hours. Well, let's give you eight hours to sleep the other 15 hours of the day that you're not at the gym. Like how much of an impact that has on your overall, uh, metabolic burn rate, you know, and that when we can find ways to just be more active, we talk a lot in our program about learning to be less efficient. We're all so darn efficient. You know, we, we just save steps and we save energy and and our bodies here, our brains calculate ways that we can do everything with a minimum of effort. And it's kind of fun to start thinking of like, how can I get through the day with a maximum of effort, you know? You know, because that happens if you can retrain yourself to be that kind of fidgety person that's always jumping up for this and putting that down and not waiting until there's a whole armload of things to take up the stairs, but just running them up one by one as you come across them. You know, th- I think that's going to have a much bigger impact on your ongoing, the body that you live in and its size and its fitness um, than that hour on the Peloton or whatever. What do you think? 
Yeah, no, you nailed it. That that non-exercise activity time. It's so uh, my, neat. My, my, <laughs> yeah, my, yeah, exactly. My good friend, uh, Tom Rafai, who I think when yeah. the LinkedIn thread- I think that's that our link. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's our, our link. Tom talks about being a neat freak. That's what right. Tom refers to it as, and neat being non-exercise activity time or thermogenesis. And it's those, if you do the, if you were to do the metabolic math to whatever extent we can really do that, yeah. uh, that you would find that that burns more calories during your day than your workout does, no matter how much you're sweating during your workout. Well, right. Because it's a ratio of 15 to one, yes, right. Yeah. In terms of time, but, and it's also not making you hungrier <laughs> Yes, yeah. and it's keeping your house neater. Yeah. I, I do want to close a loop on something that now my, my brain finally remembered the, the line of research. That's the constrained energy hypothesis and Herman Ponser for anyone who's not looked at his research that he does research on the Aboriginal tribes. And it, mm-hmm. I'll link up to it in the show notes. It's, it's some fascinating research and I'm sure you've looked at it, but it really causes calls into question the upper limits of human energy expenditure. Mm-hmm. So to throw it back to you to kind of finish the discussion on weight loss before we uh, go into another topic, if that's the case that a side effects of exercise is burning calories. It's not the direct effect, but it does a lot of other great things. Just as a dietetics professional that is working with people for habit change to lose mm-hmm. weight. So you said it earlier, everybody knows what to do. They just struggle to do it. There's a knowing doing gap, habit change and coaching closes off that gap. If you could do it succinctly to whatever degree you can talk about how you approach that from a nutrition habit change perspective. I think we need to know why we want to make a change in our life. We sometimes skip over what our motivation is, or we don't realize that we are absorbing someone else's Mm -hmm. motivation or or not motivation, but desire for us, you know, whether it's society or our doctor or a partner or, or something like that. So I think in order to make any change, because change is difficult, it just, even a good change is difficult because of the way our brains prefer to Mm -hmm. stay in their groove. And I think in order to be able to lean into the discomfort of changing behavior long enough that it starts to become the new behavior. We have to have a really compelling reason to be making those changes. And so it sounds kind of dopey, you know, to, to do those exercises where you try to drill down and access your, your motivation, your reasons. But I think that that actually is time really well spent, especially if you're willing to excavate beyond the first couple of things that bubble up, which are probably things that got planted there by some magazine article and really investigate. So there's that. Um, I think that strategic support is really important. We need to be able to uh, identify and remove the barriers, whether they're logistic, uh, emotional, environmental, like Mm -hmm. whatever they are between us and doing whatever this behavior is that we want to adopt, you know, and that's that sort of uh, behavioral economics, you know, how can we make the thing that we want to do that we want to choose the easiest thing to choose? Yes. And we could do it two ways, right? We can make that easier to choose. And we can also insert friction Mm -hmm. between us and the thing that we would rather not choose. So we, so I think that there's some we call that hacking your habitat right. in our, our program. We want to look around. And, uh, and I would just say that that is not only about our physical habitat. We can hack our schedule. Yeah. We can hack our social circles, <laughs> our social life. You know, uh, There's a lot of ways to hack our habitat in order to, to do that kind of um, uh, behavioral economics. So yeah, you have to have a really good reason. You have to have a plan. You have to have some strategic support. I think support is really, well, I'm a supporter by profession. So of course I think that that's important, but I think that when we can approach the problem solving and also just the, um, like I said before, the discomfort Mm -hmm. of creating change in a group of people who are working on similar goals and sharing their experience and, and, um, that that can be very empowering. So there's a lot of tools in our toolkit. Those are just a couple. Yeah. And I think all of that is valuable, but the thing they always take out of a conversation with a dietetics professional such as yourself is that it is incredibly nuanced and complex to get someone to change their nutrition behaviors in service of losing weight. It just is complex. Yeah. Well, food has such a complex role in our life. You know, it is 
family, it is culture. Um, it, it, for many of us, it is comfort. You know, we've absorbed a lot of messages. We've built up a lot of history. And so food is, has never been just about fuel, at mm-hmm. least not in modern life. And I don't think it ever will be. I don't really aspire to get to the point where I only see a food in terms of its nutritional, what it's giving me nutritional. I, I want to have room for pleasure mm-hmm. and, um, and sociability and culture and aesthetics and creativity and all of that. I think that's, we can have all of those things. Um, but we do need to unpack some of that other baggage around, um, food rituals and also just food as a coping mechanism, as a, a way to soothe ourselves. And, you know, I guess we just need a lot of soothing these days and the, um, availability of our chosen soother for many of us, uh, is just never been greater. We're just kind of surrounded by it all the time. That's that takes some time. That takes some work. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm working on a program right now that uh, is not quite ready yet, going to be ready soon that I'm pretty excited about that is really going to dive into this specific mm-hmm. issue of st- emotional eating and stress eating, because mm-hmm. not because I think it's insurmountable, mm-hmm. but because I think that that's where many of us have just kind of hit a hard stop and be like, what can I do? I have a stressful life yeah. and I'm a stress eater and, the, and they kind of throw in the towel and I feel like, nope. I've got some ideas about how each of us can actually overcome that learned and habituated and societally reinforced habit of stress and emotional eating, but it will take a little bit of work. And I'm, I'm really excited about actually um, putting that out into the world. That sounds like a great program. I think probably everyone on some level can benefit from going through a program like that. I, I, I certainly, oh. I certainly know I could because the, it, it is, it's a, it is a very common and to yeah. your point, very ubiquitous and readily accessible coping mechanism for us. And, and readily and reinforced, you yes. know, like ready, ex, readily acceptable, accepted, yes. Yes. but no, I mean, I only create the courses I need, right? Oh, <laughs> so. yeah, exactly. Well, and I'm going to say this next statement from my perspective, because I think it, it maybe adds a little bit more credence to it, but then I want to get your thoughts on it. Mm-hmm. I've always thought as a fitness and an exercise professional, that it is so incredibly complex, nuanced, and time-consuming to coach someone on nutrition for weight loss, that I don't have the time, the expertise, or am I really being paid for that part of my service? And the best I could hope to do is educate somebody in between their sets, why they're recovering when I'm stretching them. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Allison Mankowski on, who's a registered dietitian here at Eastern Michigan University and locally here in the Washtenaw County area. And I, I kind of said the same thing to her. By partnering with and collaborating with a registered dietitian, not only are you offloading something that is really outside of your scope of practice and it's very time consuming, but it also sets the client or patient up for the best degree of success. And I'm just curious to hear you touch on that from your perspective, because you are collaborating with exercise professionals, but you figured out a way to stay in your lanes for your own benefit and also for your client's benefit. Yeah. Scope of practice, right? Like it's, we need to be um, mindful of where our expertise lies and where we are qualified to Mm -hmm. give advice at the same time, we want to be holistic, right? Mm -hmm. We want to provide a 360 solution. We want to acknowledge that our clients and our listeners, our audience, you know, um, do all of these different things and that they all intersect and fit together. So I understand why we all end up talking Mm -hmm. about these other lifestyle. And I think that about these other features of lifestyle because they do work together. So just, um, for example, the ways in which nutrition and fitness, I mean, many people that they just go together automatically, but when you think about it, you know, why really? (laughs) It'd be make more sense for nutrition and gardening to go together, you know, and and fitness and construction or something. But anyway, we do lump them together as two halves of the same coin. But when you think about it, they're, they're really not, but, um, And yet look how they intersect, you know, the composition of our diet can really inform how we respond to certain exercise Mm -hmm. activities and the exercise activities that we do are going to have a profound impact on, for example, our appetite signals and the kinds of, you know, which is going to impact our, our intake. So we do need to coordinate. And, and I think that we do need to view what we're doing with diet 
with a mind towards, okay, and then what's happening on the, you know, on the exercise and the movement side and vice versa. But yeah, the more people we can bring into that conversation, just the way I always love the opportunity to bring in a psychologist or a behavioral Mm -hmm. expert, or, you know, there's, there's so many aspects that we can um, leverage to create healthy lifestyles, time management, right? Professional development. And so whenever we can partner up and bring those other perspectives to our audiences, I think everybody, benefits, and we benefit, you know, as, as experts to, um, to build those communities of allied, allied professionals. Yeah. As the old saying goes, it takes a village and it is there. It is very complicated to address a weight loss. It just is. And you mentioned a number of things, you know, not just nutrition, but, you know, it's psychology because there's that element, there's time management, there's, you know, the environment you're in, you just go on and on and down, on, down the list. There's mm-hmm. a lot to address and trying to do it by yourself is problematic. But you know what? One of the reasons you said it's, you know, weight loss is so challenging, you know, and one of the reasons I think that we've all experienced it as so challenging, whether it's something we've been trying to do with ourselves or something we've been trying to help a a client with is because we have been taught uh, to pursue weight loss at a pace that Mm. first of all is faster than most of us can lose fat loss. And if you're not losing fat, then what are you losing? Mm -hmm. You know, like at first some water, but then after that, right. And it's just but we've kind of in even the medical arm of the weight, even the very conservative weight loss programs, they want you losing one to 2% of your body weight a week during your weight loss phase. Mm -hmm. And that's far faster than most people can lose body fat. So we're said, and it's super stressful because in order to be losing one to 2% of your body fat, or I'm sorry, of your body weight a week, you have to pretty much cut your caloric intake in half of course, that's stressful, not just on your body, but on your lifestyle, on your family, right? Yes. On your, on everything. So, and I have found in my practice, and this is kind of the foundation of the work that we do is that when we slow that process down, when we kind of deprogram people as to their expectations about what's appropriate, what's acceptable, what's successful, um, and slow that pace of weight loss down to something closer to the, the, um, likely pace of fat loss, a lot of great things happen. First of all, it's a lot less stressful Mm -hmm. on on the body and on the life, right? A lot bigger proportion of the weight that they're losing is actually fat and not lean muscle tissue. And then the, the last piece is a little bit more subtle and it's that because it takes longer but it's okay. Cause it's not so awful, mm-hmm. but because it takes longer, it's that much more time in the trenches, building and reinforcing the habits and the behaviors and the mindsets that you're going to need in order to be able to sustain that long-term so that you don't have this kind of flat out sprint to lose the weight. And then they just dump you over the finish line and be like, okay, good luck. <laughs> you know, um, It's, it's actually walking people all the way beyond that finish line and well into the cool down laps, you yes. know, to the point that w- the withdrawal of the active program is no longer, um, a catastrophe, you know, because now they're just living the way they've been living for all this time. It's not a big deal. Precisely. It, it, it's a, it's a recalibration to a great extent of what those That's expectations a- are. Yes. And a recalibration of the body's relationship to exactly. itself. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a recalibration, right. Instead. And we, but we think of it as an intervention, mm. you know, like when you get an, an infection and they give you a bunch of antibiotics and intervention to kill the, kill the infection. And then we'll get back to normal life. That's how we approach weight loss. Yeah. And I think it, that is one of the reasons that we find it so challenging and so unsuccessful and so ineffective is because we've, we're taking the wrong paradigm. It's not an intervention. I love that word. It's a, I'm going to, I'm going to steal that, Fair enough. Go <laughs> but for I'll it. give you credit. I it's a it. recalibration. Yeah. You're recalibrating. Yeah. And, and kind of going along with that. And we, we had this conversation a little bit before we got on the air and I'm happy. We, I think we found, a, we've navigated our way to this uh, really last part of the discussion is <laughs> We're such pros. Yeah. Well, yeah. So at least, at least, <laughs> at, least well, at least one of us is. So thank you for that. Um, you know, we talk about lifestyle medicine and how yeah. it's kind of this, you know, interventional quasi interventional approach. And we talk about like recalibrating expectations and things like that. And the discussion we were having is, 
know, what, what are the, what are the limitations of, you know, lifestyle medicine? And I think physical activity, nutrition, stress management, sleep, all those great things, all very important and all very critical. And I don't think you or I, or anyone listening is going to dispute that, but there are limitations even to what that can produce at the end of the day. So just teach on that for a second, uh, just from your perspective of being in the ecosystem. I think you sort of teed this up earlier in our conversation where you were saying when one side gets a little bit more extreme then the other side has to walk itself out an equal distance on the other side of the teeter totter, right. To, yep. to maintain balance. And I think that may be what has happened here. You know, there was a time when lifestyle was not really even on our map. You mm-hmm. know, we didn't really think much about it. And, uh, and there, and there was this growth of this movement about like, no, we have to be able to pr- practice preventive medicine, lifestyle medicine, where our daily activities are the foods that we eat, the activities that we get stress, sleep, all the stuff that you just mentioned relationships, right. Support a healthy body so that we're not just whacking diseases with mm-hmm. surgery and pharmaceuticals once they're full blown. And I think that's was, and is completely valid. Mm-hmm. My little beef now though, with the lifestyle medicine folks is they feel like people aren't listening, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that there are still people who refuse to change their lifestyle, even in the face of like really scary medical consequences, Mm -hmm. or they kind of think like, well, I don't really need to change because I've got a drug for that. You know, Mm -hmm. now, now I've got the statin medication. I don't need to worry about diet. I, you know, and I've got a blood pressure medication that takes care of that. So there are some people who are not listening to that message. And as a result, the lifestyle practitioners are just shouting louder and and making it sort of a little bit more extreme. Like if you have a disease, such as the ones we always talk about in this context, right? Type two diabetes, obesity, heart disease, the usual suspects. If you have a disease, it's because you're not living right. Mm -hmm. And we need to really have some tough love here about people need to Uh, take responsibility for their choices and, and they need to understand that. And I understand the frustration for people that aren't listening, but the unintended consequence here is this, there is a, a degree or a a percentage of those same diseases that I just rattled off type two diabetes, obesity, heart disease, that is not always responsive or caused by lifestyle choices. There are genetic predispositions, you know, that are nobody's fault. And what this does is, is the people who are listening to this message and who are working really, really hard, they've drunk the Kool-Aid, right? They're, they're eating well, they're exercising, they're doing all of the things. And then their doctor says, I'm sorry, you haven't been able to get your cholesterol to the point where I'm happy with it. I need to put you on this statin drug. I can't tell you how many late night emails I have gotten from my Mm. clients and you, I can tell they're in tears on the, on the other side of their keyboards, you know, because they've worked so hard and they've accomplished so much and their doctor still wants to put them on a statin drug and they feel like they've failed and they, and they feel like they're to blame and it's their fault. And this is the unintended consequence Mm. of the sort of fetishization of lifestyle medicine is that we have failed to remember or acknowledge that sometimes you can do everything right and still need in maybe a pharmace- pharmaceutical support in order to manage a, a hereditary risk factor, or you may still be diagnosed with cancer, even though you've been a vegan for, for 40 years. And the worst thing that we can do is make those people feel like they've failed or that there's something wrong with them or that they didn't do it good enough. Believe me, that is not going to support their well-being or their healing. So I guess it's just a little, I don't know, red flag. I want to wave for the lifestyle medicine advocates and cheerleaders to always make room Mm -hmm. in those messages for those who, who really are doing everything right. And, and, and have done, taken all of the, and taken all of the advice to heart and may still require some medical support that those people have not failed. Yeah. Well, well, let me fold up my soapbox. Sorry, that got uh, no. Well said, and I think a good soapbox to be on. I think it's very similar to what we talked about with the weight neutral approach. Is that you know, yeah. the answer to all of these things? You know, lies in the middle, and I think you get there with a degree of of curiosity and open mindedness and acceptance of the the need to have multiple approaches. 
Monica, where can people go to find out more about you and all the various things you're doing? Because it sounds like you have a tremendous amount of things going on. We'll link up to all this in the show notes page, but if you can give us a little bit of direction, that'd be great. Oh, thank you. I, I, I am sprinkled around a little bit um, because people are listening to the podcast. Let me just mention the names of my two podcasts again, because awesome. that's probably the most likely place they might want to come track me down. If you want to know more about, if you want to geek out on nutrition with me, that podcast is called the Nutrition Diva. And if you're interested in the work that we do on behavior change, that podcast is called the Change Academy. Awesome. And because so much of our conversation did talk about weight loss and how that does and doesn't work. And, and some of my more unconventional views, if people are more interested, interested in learning more about that, um, I'd invite them to come check out the work that we do at wayless.life. That's our hub for our sustainable weight loss work. Awesome. And we'll link up to all those in the show notes page. And uh, Monica is also a great follow on LinkedIn. She posts a lot of great articles up there. Like I said, that's how uh, we connected. So strongly encourage you to to connect with her somewhere in uh, the various areas that she's sprinkled about. I want to thank you for this opportunity to have this conversation. This was really, as you can tell, a lot of this is very near and dear to my heart. And it's just fun to have time to really, you know, dig in a little bit. So thank you so much for the invitation. Absolutely. And I'm not going to let you go before I ask you my final question. I always add my podcast on, which is, Uh, The wellness paradox, as I view it, is the lack of interaction between our fitness and wellness professionals and our medical community. There's a gap Uh, there that uh, these professionals want to fill. You're very involved in all of this. What would you advise the professionals who are fitness and wellness uh, industry that to get there, to close off that gap? What would be your one piece of advice? Let me make sure I'm understanding the question. (laughs) Okay. You mean how can fitness professionals be invited more into this consortium how, or? Yeah. How, how can, how can fitness professionals become a valued stakeholder in the healthcare continuum? They're not there now. I hmm. think the healthcare continuum could benefit from being there. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure it's the fitness professional's fault. I mean, I I do think it's important, as you mentioned before, that we all need to be mindful of our scope of practice. Mm -hmm. I think that it's always beneficial when we can build relationships with people from other legs of the wellness industry. You know, those one one by one relationships do add up Mm -hmm. to, you know, um, meaningful dialogue between whole arms of the profession. But honestly, when I think about your question, I feel like the fault is more on the side of the medical professionals who may have certain um, stereotypes in mind when they think about who is interested in fitness, who does fitness, and may undervalue the professionalism and the training and the scientific integrity of people who are doing what you're doing. So I I guess that's maybe not very helpful for fitness professionals, but I would almost more challenge our, our medical professionals be like, Hey, why are you guys leaving this resource on the table? Why do you not see, you know, how valuable this can be and how rich this partnership could be? Is that fair to say? Absolutely. And I think that that is a very, very important perspective. And I, I appreciate all the perspectives for coming at a really complex issue. Uh, Monica, this was awesome. I feel like we could have probably talked for another two hours and I am, you're likely going to end up back on the podcast at some point again for a part two on many of these topics, but for now, thank you so much for your time. I hope so. And thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Monica as much as I did. If you found it insightful and informative, please share with your friends and colleagues. Those shares really do make a difference for us. Any additional information that we'd like to share with you from today's episode can be found on the show notes page by going to wellnessparadoxpod.com forward slash episode four, three. Please be on the lookout for next week's episode when it drops on Wednesday. And if you have a moment, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. Those reviews are critical for helping us grow the podcast. Until we chat again next week, please be well.